the topic for this section is valvular heart disease. Valvular heart disease is typically defined by the valve it affects. The mitral valve and the aortic valve will be most commonly effective, but there can also be valvular disease in the tricuspid and pulmonary valve as well. Functional alterations can include stenosis or narrowing of the valve or regurgitation, which consists of backflow of blood through the valve. A normal functioning valve will open and close completely. If there is a stenosed valve, it is unable to open sufficiently during left atrial systole, inhibiting left ventricular filling. If there is regurgitation, such as in the mitral valve, the valve does not close completely during left ventricular systole, permitting blood to re-enter the left atrium. The pressure on either side of an open valve should be equal. But when there is a valve that has stenosis, the valvular opening is typically smaller. So the forward flow of blood is impaired, and it creates a difference in pressure on the two sides of the valve. The amount of stenosis is seen in the pressure differences. So the higher the difference, the greater the stenosis. The stenotic mitral valve takes on a fish mouth shape because of the thickening and shortening of the mitral valve structures. In regurgitation, there is inc incomplete closure of the valve leaflets, which results in the black backflow of blood. The most common cause of mitral valve stenosis is rheumatic heart disease. Less common causes can include congenital mitral stenosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and systemic lupus. The structural deformities can cause obstruction of blood flow and, cre and create a pressure difference between the left atrium and the left ventricle during diastole. The left atrial pressure and volume increase. This causes higher pulmonary vascular pressure and then hypertrophy of the pulmonary vessels. So typical signs and symptoms of someone with mitral valve stenosis will be exertional dyspnea because of the reduced lung compliance. They may have fatigue and palpitations, and you may see atrial fibrillation. They will oftentimes have a heart murmur. Less common signs and symptoms you might see is hoarseness of the voice, hemoptysis, chest pain, seizure, and stroke. Most causes of mitral regurgitation are caused by myocardial infarction, chronic rheumatoid heart disease, mitral valve prolapse, and infective endocarditis. Mitral valve regurgitation allows blood to flow back from the left ventricle to the left atrium due to incomplete valve closure during systole. Left ventricle and left atrium are both working harder to preserve adequate cardiac output. Oftentimes, a person with mitral valve regurgitation doesn't have acute signs and symptoms. It'll be more chronic. They're usually asymptomatic for many years, but by the time they come into the hospital, they're very weak, fatigued, they may have shortness of breath, palpitations, they may have an audible S3 heart sound, and an audible murmur. With mitral valve prolapse, there is an abnormality of the mitral valve leaflets. So the leaflets prolapse or buckle back into the left atrium during systole. There is no known cause for mitral valve prolapse and usually it's benign. It only occurs in about 2 to 6 percent of the U.S. population and although it's usually benign there can be serious complications that can occur. These can include mitral valve regurgitation, infective endocarditis, sudden cardiac death, and cerebral ischemia. Most patients with mitral valve prolapse will remain asymptomatic for life, but others may have the following clinical manifestations. Fatigue, heart palpitations, dizziness and syncope, tachycardia, they may have atypical chest pain. The patient may also have a murmur that results from regurgitation that you'll hear more intensely during systole. There also may be one or more clicks heard,
in mid systole to late systole. Aortic valve stenosis in children is typically because of a congenital defect. In adults, aortic stenosis is the result of rheumatic fever. Aortic stenosis causes obstruction of flow from the left ventricle to the aorta during systole. The left ventricle hypertrophies and there's increased myocardial oxygen consumption because of the increased myocardial size. As the disease progresses and compensatory mechanisms fail, there's reduced cardiac output, which leads to de decreased tissue perfusion, pulmonary hypertension, and heart failure. So typical signs and symptoms of someone with aortic valve stenosis will be angina, syncope, exertional dyspnea. They may have a normal to soft S1, but diminished or absent S2, heart murmur, they may have a loud S4, but typically someone with aortic valve stenosis has a poor prognosis. Aortic valve regurgitation is typically a result of rheumatic heart disease, a congenital heart defect, or untreated syphilis. Aortic regurgitation causes retrograde blood flow from the ascending aorta into the left ventricle during diastole, resulting in volume overload. The left ventricle initially compensates for this acute regurgitation by dilation and hypertrophy. Myocardial, myocardial contractility will eventually decline and blood volume will increase in the left atrium and pulmonary bed. This results in pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular failure. So typically the patient will be asymptomatic for many years but as the pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular failure increases the patient will have exertional dyspnea, orthopenia, paradoxical nocturnal dyspnea, and may have a diastolic heart murmur. To diagnose valvular heart disease, we'll start out with a history and physical. An echocardiogram will be done to evaluate the valve structure, function, and size of the heart chambers. An ECG will evaluate the heart rhythm and look for ischemia. A chest x-ray will be done to determine the size of the heart. A cardiac catheterization or angiogram will be done to measure the pressures inside the valves and the size of the valve opening. Labs may also be drawn to rule out infection. In general, when we're assessing a patient with valvular disease, we may find some of the following abnormal assessments. Abnormal heart sounds, they may be tachycardic and have dysrhythmias, we may see hypotension. Due to fluid overload and changes within pulmonary pressures, we may see crackles, wheezes, hoarseness of the voice. In the GI system, we may see ascites in the abdomen or enlargement of the liver. Looking at the skin, the patient may be diaphoretic. They may have peripheral edema. We may see temperature changes and clubbing of the fingernails due to decreased oxygen perfusion. Treatment for someone with valvular disease will focus on preventing complications. So preventing exacerbations of heart failure, acute pulmonary edema, thromboembolisms, and the possibility for either recurrent endocarditis or getting infective endocarditis. Drug therapy will vary for patients depending on the type of valve disorder and the extent of their valve disorder, but typical medications will include digitalis, diuretics, antidysrhythmics, antidysrhythmics beta blockers, anticoagulants, and potentially antibiotics. There will be patient teaching regarding anticoagulants. If the patient ends up needing surgical valve replacement, they will have to be on anticoagulants for the rest of their lives. If the patient has some vegetations within the valve, they're at risk for getting clots, so they would also need to be on an anticoagulant. Also, whenever we're worried about blood pooling in the atriums or the ventricles, we're worried about a, the stasis blood flow leading to clot formation, again needing the anticoagulant therapy. Someone with mitral valve disease, whether they have just the disease or a replacement, is at risk for infective endocarditis. So this is another person who would need prophylactic antibiotics anytime they're having dental procedures or any invasive procedures.
They should be on a low-sodium diet. They're probably fatigued, so they'll need activity modifications. They may need oxygen and need oxygen teaching. They should avoid infectious people. They should avoid stress and try to avoid activities that will make them too tired. They should get an adequate rest, have good hygiene. They should know the signs and symptoms of infection. They should, it's, they should know how important it is for them to follow up with their physician. And then they'll need all of the same previous teaching as all of our cardiac patients do. Valve repair is usually the surgical procedure of choice. It has a lower operative mortality rate than valve replacement and is often used in mitral and tricuspid valvular disease. Valve replacement may be required for mitral, aortic, tricuspid, and occasionally pulmonic valve disease. The surgical treatment of choice for combined aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation is valve replacement. There are two types of valves that can be used for valve replacement, mechanical and biological. Mechanical are long-lasting but will require anticoagulation for the rest of the person's life. A biological valve can wear out, it typically lasts about 7 to 10 years. There is less chance for clot formation than with a mechanical valve, so typically the patient does not need to be on anticoagulants. So depending on the person's age, other health problems may determine what type of valve a patient would get. So if you can think about a patient that would not be a candidate for either mechanical or biological valve, you might think about a patient who can't be on anticoagulants or who shouldn't be on anticoagulants. So potentially a patient who is high risk for falls, a patient who's of childbearing age, a patient who has some type of bleeding disorder. Those types of patients probably would not want to or could not be on an anticoagulant, so it would be more appropriate for those patients to have a biological valve. The TAVI, or the trans aortic valve implantation, is a catheter-based catheter -based valve replacement. This is typically done on older patients that are typically not candidates for open heart valve replacement procedures. With the TAVI, the aortic valve is placed similar to a procedure like a cardiac catheterization where they enter through the groin and travel up to the heart to the placement of the valve. The valve is then put in place and left there. Our post-op assessments for our patients who've had valve replacement will be the same as all of our patients who've had a surgical procedure. We will make sure we are assessing their uh, incision. So it may be a sternal incision. If they've had a groin approach, we may be assessing the groin. We're paying close attention to their cardiac output and watching for any signs and symptoms of heart failure. They may be getting digoxin to improve their cardiac output and to prevent atrial fibrillation, so we'd closely be monitoring their vitals. They'll need post-op teaching, of course, and if they're given a mechanical valve, they're definitely going to need information on anticoagulants. So warfarin or Coumadin is a common medication that is given to patients with valve replacement. Typically, it interferes with the production of vitamin K-dependent coagulation components. Other than being used for valve replacement, it's used for patients with atrial fib, patients who have a deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and of course, there's many other reasons as well. But a patient who's on warfarin frequently needs to have their INR or international ratio monitored. There are several complications of warfarin and the big one is bleeding. So we'll see patients with GI bleeds. If they fall, they can have internal hemorrhage. If they hit their head, they can have subdural hematoma. If they cut themselves, they can have um, difficulty with um, getting the bleeding to stop. So there also are drug interactions, and they need to know which over-the-counter medications they can and cannot take. 
and they also have to know which foods that they should try to avoid or have a consistent amount of dietary intake with. So your INR level or the therapeutic effects of Coumadin can re be reversed with the administration of vitamin K. The patient can also get fresh frozen plasma. There are alternatives for patients who have atrial fibrillation. There's a medication called Pradaxa. But you have to make sure your patients who are going home on Coumadin know what they should expect. They should know that they're going to have their labs drawn frequently. So they may be initially going into the physician's clinic once a week, twice a week. Eventually it'll get more regular where maybe they only go once a month. They should know that they may have to do frequent dose changes. They probably should have a pill cutter. The patient should also know that they should take their medications in the evening because what will happen is they'll go in the morning to get their labs drawn at their clinic. The physician, nurse practitioner, PA will get the lab results. They'll call the patient later that day and they may change their dose. So the patient wants to be able to take their dose in the evening so they can increase or decrease their dose based on their INR level. Also, our INR level needs to be what's called in a therapeutic range. So typically someone who has a mechanical valve, the INR, the goal, again it will depend on the healthcare provider and the patient, but typically the goal is between 2.5 and 3.5, which is much higher than someone who does not have a valve. So when they're in that range, we call that therapeutic. If they're below that range, it's subtherapeutic. And if it's above that range, it's super therapeutic. So a patient who's super therapeutic is at risk for bleeding, higher risk for bleeding, and a patient who's subtherapeutic is at risk for clotting. Listed here are just a few potential nursing diagnoses for a patient with valvular disease. Excessive fluid volume, decreased cardiac output, activity intolerance, knowledge deficit. And when you're doing your planning for a patient with valvular disease, some of your goals may be that the patient will have normal cardiac function. This may or may not be possible. It'll depend on the treatment for the patient if they've had valvular replacement or not. Improved activity intolerance, understanding of the disease process and preventative measures. So something to remember is that these patients oftentimes have been sick for a very long time, so they usually take a longer time to recover. So when you're evaluating your nursing care plans, you may be reevaluating goals and changing interventions as time goes on. So when you're evaluating your goals and the interventions based on your nursing diagnosis, you may evaluate if the patient is able to have cardiac tolerance and increased activity, have they returned to normal blood pressure, heart rate, and breath sounds? Do they have decreased or no peripheral edema? Do they have decreased or no fatigue? Do they know the signs and symptoms of when to call their health care provider? Do they know when to use prophylactic antibiotics? And do they, are they adhering to their therapeutic regimen as outlined by the nurse or the physician or whatever health care provider is managing their care?